Hi everyone in Cloud Computing and welcome to episode 59 of the Cloud Computing Australia show which is featured on YouTube and podcast with Brad Nelson and internationally recognised and the world's number one cloud industry expert and thought leader David Linthicum. This show is sponsored by Nelson Hilliard, Cloud Computing Recruitment Specialist, placing great people in cloud, IoT, fintech and AI. In this week's show, we're excited to have Sabjeet Jahal on our show as our special guest. Sabjeet is a technology strategist who is building cloud and digital transformation programs and teams. He helps CIOs, CTOs, CXOs in formulating and executing their digital transformational journeys. Besides cloud, Subject passionately talks about innovation, incubation and consumption economics. In this week's show, we are talking about governance of government and federal tech initiatives. Hi Dave and Subject, a warm welcome to you both. It's great to have you both on the Australia show this week. It's Hi, great Brad. to be here, Brad. It's great to have you on there, Subject. How are you today? You good? I'm doing great, thanks. I'm happy to be here. Excellent. And you, Dave, you, uh, you good to be on another Australia show? Yeah, I'm good to be on another Australian show. I'm in California today, so I'm in the same state as subject, I believe. And look at that, I got palm trees behind me. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I was thinking, is that Southern California, David? Yeah, I'm in San Diego today. Oh, Flying out early for some meetings, but uh, they put me up in Airbnb, which is uh, like an apartment, so it's great. So I lucked out. Well, fantastic. Well, look, guys, let's open with this question that's coming to you then, Dave. Uh, will Australia allow cloud computing to grow naturally, do you think? Or will there be a great deal of interference from the, the, the internal workings of uh, those, uh, those great guys within government? <laughs> yeah, I think that the, the honest answer is, is the government really kind of always interferes. It's kind of what governments, governments do. And I think when they see cloud computing rising, we're seeing this in the States as well that they're trying to figure out how to, in essence, um, drive more security and more governance around the utilization of new technology such as cloud while trying not to interfere, but by not interfering and at being more proactive and reactive in nature to some of this stuff, I think that there's gonna be some latency in Australia as well as any government right now all around the world you know, based on adoption of any new technology. I think that you know, the biggest thing we're going to see in the next few years is going to be the limitations placed on cognitive computing and the utilization of data because we're, we're kind of, you know, don't even understand the potential of that. The ability to derive information out of massive amounts of information that we already have on file, you know, that weren't that aren't necessarily there. And so we can find out, you know, personally identifiable information in terms of how people are buying things online and you know, leveraging social media as to, you know, whether, you know, there's their sexual orientation, whether or not they have a specific disease or not, the demographics, you know, how many kids they have, uh, you know, all these sorts of things that around information we're typically not willing to give up. So the government stepping forward and, and you know, putting limitations on that probably is, is not necessarily a bad thing. But at the end of the day, we're trying to be as advanced and, 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 iter, uh, and innovative with the technology as we, as we can. And so their impact is not necessarily going to be welcome in those instances. So it's a typical balancing act that I have to advise my clients on. Uh, what are your thoughts on that, subject? I think, I think David is spot on that governments, uh, they do want to keep sort of, sort of uh, a, a tap on the uh, unfair practices being adopted by any companies because they have a sort of um, immense amount of intelligence based on data even if they are not looking into the data itself, just having the metadata about, you know, like who's talking to who or, or how many people, which company is hiring how many people, for example, uh, just really, uh, LinkedIn acquired, uh, by, got acquired by Microsoft, right? And then now Microsoft knows where the talent is going and who's talking about what talent-wise. That's huge, actually, even if they... Um, don't tap into the lower level stuff. It's still, they have a lot of data and they got the GitHub. So the Git is the repository of the code and LinkedIn is the repository of the talent. And it's kind of a little iffy, actually. I think the government will wake up to it later. Uh, as we all, always know that, that regulators are always running a little behind uh, as, when it comes to technology. So I think... Uh, uh, they will spot on. I think uh, regulators will be kind of more active. I see European regulators more active than than the the, the North American or American actually in general uh, regulators. Yeah. 
Yeah, I think they're running a lot of it behind. I think that's where we kind of run into the latency. I mean, one of the let's not to um, you know kind of moving away from Australia into the United States. I always you know get a get a, a kick out of when the Congress is debating technology, and you're you know a congressman who's probably never touched a laptop in the last twenty years is you know talking about different data elements, things like that. They always get things wrong. So I think there really needs to be in Australia and the U.S. and Europe, you know, some sort of a an elite group that's an advisory board to the legislators out there, because I don't think they really kind of understand enough. And they will subpoena, you know, technology leaders, but typically it's the CEOs, you know, not necessarily, you know, people who are technically um, competent like you and I uh, to kind of tell them the essence of what the issues are and really kind of how to think about it. And so. You know, one of the things I think if we're looking to change government is to really kind of inform government more. And I think that's where, you know, the role of the technology providers need to kind of step in. And, you know, that being said, as soon as the larger um, companies, you know, the billion dollar market makers uh, out there, and we know who those usual suspects are, you know, get involved, they typically get the lobbyists and the spin doctors in place and not necessarily getting that. So I would love to see the Australian government just kind of get uh, you know, 20 or 30 core technical types, you know, data scientists, the cloud SME, uh, uh, security SME. And, you know, even if the high tech organizations are loaning these people out for a year and then, so they have to serve time and then come back in the company, I think that's a step in the right direction. Because I think right now it's probably the more important thing is that not, it's not that government, you know, will get involved in this. And I think they'll get involved in this. And I think they should get involved in this but the ability to kind of understand and be proactive and do the right things. And I do see some, you know, kind of bad decisions coming around. And I think that, uh, you know, we need to start shining lights on it and make sure everybody has to say into it. And ultimately that they're getting the best information. I don't think they are. I mean, when I look at some of the legislation coming out, the way they're written, you know, they're, they're typically not getting advice from, you know, any of the technologists out there understand anything about, you know, this stuff. And if you you can't do it from a physical point of view or from a, you know, physics point of view, um, then you may not try it. And so I think that's what's the, the gap between kind of reality and where the government is today. What are your thoughts? Yeah, I, I think the, the uh, internationally talking, right, Australia, um, any any uh, decent sized economies, I will say, like uh, participating in these discussions internationally is a great thing. There are, we, we have some great international institutions like UNO, IEEE, and there's some standards bodies, right? I, 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 ISO and so forth. I, I think some of the, they have to participate at international level through these experts. They should form some sub committees or subcommittees at the government level in each country so they can represent that country in these international bodies. I think the standards around AI, ethical use of AI, if you will, they, they have to be talked about internationally. If we don't, uh, we will have this disparities like like we saw China just uh, doing some like very outrageous things with the human genome uh, sequencing. Are they they're just changing like uh, uh, live bodies? You know, they are producing sort of uh, manufactured kids, if you will, children, right? So they they they, can, they they are actually pushing the limits, and that that scares humanity in general. Like, oh my God, if they can do that, then India can follow, Australia can follow, some others, other people can say, oh, we don't want to be left behind. So I think the uh, international bodies can play play a big role. And, and then nationally, some, some forming some committees, the, the thought leaders and or um, evangelists who talk about technology, all of them, they should be involved locally. And I think governments should put some, some budget and efforts uh, into that. that. That's a great idea. Yeah, I, I think that, uh, you know, I would be willing to volunteer my time. I don't know about you, uh, you know, if it's whatever, you know, for whatever government that's trying to really kind of figure out technology and how to legislate correctly about it. Not necessarily somebody that has a political interest, yeah, yeah. Uh, but someone that has an interest in the technology and how it should be leveraged and leveraged effectively. And also, it's also in an ethical way. I think we're we're dealing with, with techno-ethics uh, at the government level probably more so in the next five years than we have in the last 30 years. And of course, we've had you know, kind of the science fiction things around uh, you know, 2001 A Space Odyssey and you know, uh, how, the, you know, how the computer, but now we're trying to see, we're, not, we're starting to see that really kind of come to life where it's actually taking jobs and driverless cars are replacing taxi cabs and 
driverless trucks are replacing truck drivers. And, you know, we have, you know, tens of thousands of people who are going to be displaced out of work coming forward, as well as the fact that we're able to leverage this technology and weaponize it in certain ways that we weren't able to before. Actually, cloud computing is enabling that, not because we're creating much new technology in the cloud, but we're just making it dirt cheap. And so I can do things with 10 bucks a month, you know, that I couldn't do with $10 million a month, you know, uh, 10 years ago. And so we have to uh, set uh, logical limits that are not necessarily going to hinder productivity. You know, it's almost like the growth of the web back in the late 90s. I mean, the government just kind of let it go, it didn't tax it. And, but we had kind of self-regulatory things like the W3C and, you know, uh, uh, you know different security standards that are coming around. Now we have so much investment and so, you know, trillions of dollars that are in this technology. And I think that it's, and it also international markets that are made now where it's not necessarily nationally focused, you know, where this is going to be a larger and larger deal. And I, I'm not sure, you know, who can intervene and put, um, you know, healthy regulations in it. I guess it's the, I guess it's the governments, but, you know, I would like to see people come to a common agreement as to what these things are, what needs to be regulated, what needs to be governed. And also, what's out of the threshold of an ethical issue? What's out of the threshold of, of a uh, of a good use case of various technologies? Because I think we're losing sight of that right now. We're tracking too many people. We're driving, you know, too much out of the data. And we have to start asking ourselves, you know, not if we can do it, but should we? Yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah. I think the, there's some human rights uh, sort of questions um, are being raised at the same time. And there are some business ethics sort of uh, questions being raised. If some, some one company has too much sort of lever, uh, then what will that do to other companies? And Europeans are after big tech companies. We have seen it. Uh, and they are sort of attacking Amazon. They find Google many times. And we know what happened to Microsoft in 90s and in 2000s, right? So they were sort of hampered. Their, their growth was hampered uh, by the regulators. I think similar thing will happen to the other big guys who are becoming big. That's Amazon and Google. So, um, yeah, I've seen this mega, what I call some kind of tech religions being formed, like the three big, you know, players. They are sucking the sort of life out of all the other sort of players, if you will, uh, because of the, the inertia they have, the, the amount of innovation uh, or the pace of innovation uh, they are sort of experiencing and the, the new features they can spit out. So the, those mega platforms are kind of, it, it's in, in a way it's a good thing. At the same time, it's kind of a little bit um, uh, scary for other people not to be able to enter the market. What do you think it's going to take for government to, you know, realize they're so far behind? Who, who's going to actually be the person that in, within government to say, look, we really need to get some outside help. Uh, we're being, it looks like we're potentially being taken advantage of. We're being hoodwinked. You know, we're, we're not being told what we need to be told in order to step up to the, the bar. Who do you think and when do you think that's going to happen? <laughs> yeah, I think they're already, they react on events, um, certainly in Australia and certainly in the States and certainly in Europe. And so if they perceive a, an issue coming forward with something bad happen, they're going to go ahead and step up and try to take corrective action. And typically legislation creating laws are the only tools that they have to make it happen. And probably the you know, best case in the United States would it would be the um, manipulation of the election that they see. Of course, they, they uh, look at the 2016 election, but it's been ongoing for you know um, you know 10 years, and in, in essence, foreign powers that are reaching out and uh, not necessarily manipulating election directly, but spinning certain information. And whether that has an effect or not it doesn't really matter, but they're they're uh, cognitive to it, and so they're looking to do something about it. Yeah, it's going to be big events. It's going to be big hacks that occur. It's going to be um, security uh, issues that I think are going to drive a lot of this. It's going to be the release of personally identifiable information that, that people don't necessarily know that they're releasing. And it's going to be the constitu constituents of these, uh, you know, political, you know, electorates, you know, who are going in essence react to the needs of people who they know are voting for them. And I think that's going to be an Australia, that's going to be the United States, that's going to be in Europe for the most part, as well as we're going to see some reaction in China and some of the other Asian pack stuff. Yeah, I, I, I think they would spot on. I, I believe the, the the problem of fake news actually, it, right? So it, it can change the shape of the society, if you will. A foreign government can can sort of tamper with your system. 
uh, the, the academic economic system, the political system, um, the social economic fabric, if you will, right? Um, it's a threat and and governments have to be uh, sort of alert about that, what's going on. And the companies should be account held accountable for that. that. Facebook is in the news all the time. They have lost $50 billion in market cap in about the last six, seven months. Um, but uh, that's the financial loss only. They're, they're not held accountable like uh, legally right now, but I think they will be uh, at some point, and they should be. Um, it has caused a lot of problem in other countries. And in Myanmar, people were getting killed because of the people can, anybody can be on, sort of they can spread the fake news or somebody's attacking you and these other people attack other people. So it, it's getting a little um, crazy out there. So I think uh, you, I think your question was who in the government can sort of start this bringing in these experts in. I, I think the agencies in the government can. In U.S., FBI is doing that a little bit. They are doing hackathons, sort of like they put these events in the bigger cities and bring these coders, hackers in, and, and they talk to them about stuff and they learn a lot from them and then they tell them what they are doing in in these agencies. I think agencies can play a big role. CIA, FBI is doing that in U.S. I think similar agencies in Australia, um, India, China is a little different animal, but they are they're doing it. China is, is of course doing purely government. It's the one way. There's no sort of there's only one M party system there, right? Uh, but in de democratic countries, um, I think these uh, institutions, local institutions, can go to the uh, sort of masses and, and tap into the so the tech, uh, tech hubs uh, of the country, like the bigger cities. Yeah, they can get engaged with them. Yeah, sure, sure, good answer. Thanks, Subject. And David, it leads on nicely to your uh, top three tips, please. Yeah, these are easy to write this week because I deal a lot with this. So number one, don't let regulations hinder progress. You know, dial them into the plans. I hear a lot of people that are waiting for the shoe to drop in terms of regulations that are being put forward and are probably too tied into the political process. and too much thinking about what potential rules and regulations are going to come down. And I think that's absolutely not the way to do it. You're, you're going to react to certain rules and regulations and any sort of a, a compliance and governance plan, but ultimately uh, you need to dial that latency into your plans, not necessarily let it drive you. Uh, make sure to adjust budgeting and training. Um, I think that uh, we need to sit down and understand that we're going to have to understand new aspects about, um, you know, data governance and things like that. And so, in other words, if we're going to be tasked with proactively securing our information in different ways or accounting for our information in different ways, you need to make sure that there's money to make that happen. If any people have a tendency to fall by the wayside and fall out of compliance, uh, it's because they missed the funding boat. And so, in other words, they didn't do the budgetary planning to get things in place to make it happen. And never being afraid to fail and move on to other directions. I think that, you know, ultimately, um, many people run, live in fear of a lot of government, you know, government uh, compliance issues, fines and suspensions and things like that. And I don't think that's necessarily going to be a game stopper. And I think that if you're waiting for, you know, something to go wrong and overreacting to it, you're not necessarily going to be um, be productive. And so uh, I'd say still the fail fast policies really kind of stands if you're in a very well regulated industry, such as healthcare and finance in the States and healthcare and finance in Australia as well. Um, but don't let it affect the way in which you behave in an agile state and understand that this is all about innovation and creativity. Yeah, great top tips there, Dave. Thanks very much for those this week. Really good. Thank you. You're welcome. And Subjit, thanks for being part of the Australia show this week. It's great to have you as our special guest for all three shows this week. We've got the uh, C-Suite show coming up and the training show. So thank you so much for your time. Yeah, it was great. Thank you. Uh, you're welcome. And thanks for watching, everyone. We hope you enjoyed watching this week's show. Subject's a great special guest, and he's pretty prolific on Twitter, so no doubt you'll uh, you'll be finding all these shows all over his Twitter page at some point, which would be awesome. You can get David on Twitter, which is at David Linthicum. Uh, Subject is also on Twitter, which is at Subjit Jahal. Uh, I'm on Twitter, which is at Nelson underscore Hilliard. We're on all the social media, so come and check us out. Be part of this cloud tribe that we've got going on at the moment. We love to get your feedback on the shows, and anyone that wants to be a special guest, you know, get in touch. We'd love to find out more about what you'd like to talk about. That'd be great. This goes out on iTunes and Stitcher as podcasts as well. So you don't have to watch us, uh, which is fair enough. You can just listen to us as well, which is always good. And probably 
better than watching us talk as well. So anyway, moving on. Uh, but thanks for watching and until next week.